So we're going to talk about process. Process, super sexy, data-driven. Everybody says it. Hopefully, we'll make process kind of interesting. So my name is Tim Wilson. I often also go by Gilligan on data. Uh, there's a story behind Gilligan. It's the same reason for any of you who want to go up and introduce yourself to Justin or get your picture taken with him. Uh, Google Analytics celebrity, he is, he's kind of Finway on data. And the Finway and the Gilligan are very, very linked and tied together. So if you're looking for a conversation starter, ask him what the hell I'm talking about. So I've been doing digital analytics for uh, over a decade at a lot of companies that had kind of blue and green logos, which didn't fit real well with my red Gilligan shirt. So most recently, a couple of months ago, I joined Web Analytics Demystified, which is a digital analytics uh, consultancy. And that's now what I do. So enough about me. Diving into being data-driven. Everybody wants to be data-driven. Like, you're, it's kind of a requirement. If you're a marketer and somebody says, do you want to be data-driven? If you say no, you're just going to get shown the door, right? We have to be data-driven. But there's a challenge. What the hell does that even mean? It's a fancy buzzword. As marketers, we love buzzwords. Being data-driven, it's, you know, hey, I get to sound fancy. I'm being data-driven. I have data. I have Google Analytics. I have reports. I have dashboards. If we asked 100 marketers to describe being data-driven, we'd get a whole bunch of different words. Everybody would say big data, because they, they have to, because you have to say big data these days. But some people would say reports, dashboards, predictive analytics, BI, customer insight, Google Analytics, that other company that Google Analytics sometimes competes with. So it's a little vague and amorphous. It sounds fancy, but we need to kind of simplify it. We need to understand that we can make it simpler. When it comes to being data-driven, it really boils down to two ways that we can actually use data to drive our business forward. The first way sounds kind of boring. It's simple. It's not easy. But it's performance measurement. Performance measurement is nothing more than saying, am I achieving what I set out to achieve? I had goals. Am I achieving them? It's not explaining why I'm not achieving them or why I am achieving them. It's just simply answering that question, am I, am I doing what I, what I set out to do? The second thing is hypothesis validation, which is a hell of a mouthful. And I'm going to say hypothesis a lot in this presentation. And then I'm going to say, don't go out and talk about hypotheses, because you'll, you'll turn people off. But true analysis is hypothesis validation. That's where we get learning. That's where we actually learn new stuff, figure stuff out that will help us move our organization forward. Now, there's one other thing that has to happen when we're doing analytics and using data, and that's a whole bunch of support stuff. We have to have technology in place. We have to be capturing the data. We have to be doing tagging. We have to have data governance. We have to train our users on how to get at the data. We have to troubleshoot stuff. So that has to happen as well. But if we look at these three things, and we're spending resources. We're investing our time, our money in these three things when it comes to being data driven. And the real danger is getting sucked down into support, getting the next new tool because there's some data that you didn't have and you need to get that brought in, or getting your, your Adobe Site Catalyst tagging perfect and pristine, and continuing to spin saying, we don't have insights. Insights aren't emerging. We must need to get more tools or clean up our tools. If we look at this as kind of a, a portfolio of where we're investing our dollars, and we look at it this way, and we ask ourselves, are we actually carving off a significant amount of our resources to do hypothesis validation? Because that's the only way that we're really going to move the business forward, move ourselves forward. We have to do performance measurement. But we have to do it right and well and efficiently. And we have to do support. But we've got to be spending time doing hypothesis validation. So great. It's nice, I'm a consultant, so it's easy for me to put up three boxes and say these are the three things that we're doing. But how do we actually bring that to life? Well, I believe you've got people process and technology, and we don't spend enough time thinking about the process for analytics. We think about the people, we need to have analysts. We think about the technology, because there are hundreds and hundreds of platforms out there that we can deploy. But how are we actually operationalizing that? How are we managing it so that people connected to technology are using it in a way that is actually delivering results that we can do good stuff with? So I have a framework, call it Adapt to Act and Learn. There's really no magic to adapt to act and learn. It's sort of a linear process. 
It just kind of fit into a neat acronym, kind of by accident. If I break it down, it's the first part, ADAPT, is all an acronym, and the first part is aligning. And as Rachel said, I'm gonna talk about aligning, and it's aligning on goals and KPIs. It's easy to say, but in my experience, we tend to skip alignment a lot. Alignment should happen once. It should happen at the beginning of the campaign. It should happen maybe once a year for a new channel. At the kickoff of an initiative that's gonna be six months long, you set, you align on what you're trying to accomplish, you set up how you're gonna measure it, and then you move on. But everybody, it's not just for measurement, we're doing that so everybody is clear on what is it we're trying to achieve. We drop below that little line and we get to discovering, assessing, and prioritizing hypotheses. That needs to be running in an ongoing, continuous process. But it needs to have some focus, it needs to have some clarity that that's what we're doing. We're discovering, assessing, and prioritizing hypotheses. Because we can do that pretty quickly and efficiently with the goal of when it comes to actually testing hypotheses, validating them, we're always working on the ones that have the most potential to add value for the company. It's not enough just to deliver then actionable insights. Analysts love to do that. We're like, we delivered actionable insights. You know how much value there is in an actionable insight? None, if you don't actually take action. So analysts, we tend to sometimes stop and say, we told them what they needed to do. It's not my problem if they didn't do it. So we actually can have our process drive and make us more likely to actually act. And then we're still not done because a series of discrete actions is not inherently organizational learning. And that's ultimately what we want to do. We want as an organization to get smarter and better at what we're doing. And if we have a really good process and good analysts and well-implemented technology, uh, we, we can do that. So we'll start off with a line. So a line goes hand in hand with performance measurement. It's nothing more than clearly established goals and KPIs. If you talk to an analyst, saying the words goals and KPIs is like saying peanut butter and jelly. It just rolls right off, the turn, right off our lips. And somebody says, what's a KPI? We say, oh, it's a key performance indicator. It's a success measure. We're, start, we're throwing out buzzwords like crazy. Problem is, if we walk into the kickoff for a campaign, and everybody's excited to get this initiative going, and then there's some analyst in there saying, what are our KPIs? It's like a big, wet dish rag just thrown over the entire meeting. And nobody really wants, they're like, KPIs, what's a KPI? Or maybe they're like, I know the KPIs. Oh, you're the analyst. We're gonna want data. So here's what happens. They wanna move on past that. They just <laughs> throw out every data point they've ever seen, they might wanna see, that might be relevant, and say, let's just, yeah, here you go, these are your KPIs. Well, here's the thing, the K in KPI, I had this little epiphany a couple of weeks ago. It's a key performance indicator. K also, in the metric system, it's like abbreviation for 1,000, and I was like, do, are people really confused? Do they not know what a KPI is, and they think that it's 1,000 indicators of performance? No, it's a key performance indicator. But we started the whole conversation wrong by saying, what are your KPIs? There's a simpler way to do it. I hate business jargon. And I started using these, what I call the two magic questions. I had a guy I worked with named, named Matt Cohen who, who would use these in some, some training and they totally made sense and so I kind of took a little marketing hat and said I'm gonna call those the two magic questions. Let's not say goals, let's not say objectives, let's not say strategy, let's not say tactics, let's not say KPIs or success measures. Let's start with a pretty simple question. What is it we're trying to achieve? We're not asking for metrics. All we're looking for is we're standing up a new microsite and everybody on the team, any one of us should be able to get on the elevator tomorrow morning and somebody two, three levels above us in the organization gets on, says, oh, Tim, what are you working on? Oh, I'm working on the new microsite for that, uh, to support that new campaign. What are you trying to achieve? Generally, they're not expecting me to say, I'm gonna deliver X dollars of incremental revenue. They're also not looking for me to barf out a lot of metrics. They just want to know, why are you doing that? What are you trying to achieve? Well, hey, we're, we're having a new product launch, a big campaign rolling out around that, a lot of promotion. We want to make sure that we have one spot that everyone can go to, any potential customer can go to, to learn everything they might need to know uh, to make them confident in making a purchase decision. It's plain English. What are we trying to do? Spending a little time to say how in one or two or three sentences can we clearly articulate what we're trying to achieve. 
When it comes to social media, that step gets skipped almost every time. And because it requires a little bit of thought. But it requires, it's, it's cheap in that you haven't measured anything. You're at the outset. You can make sure every, all the stakeholders agree, yes, this is what we're trying to achieve. Once you've answered that question, and only once that question has been answered, is the second question. How are we gonna know if we've done that? And you read that and you're like, oh, you're actually asking for KPIs. Yeah, but I'm not asking for metrics or success measures. I'm saying, how are we going to know we've achieved that? And because we've answered that first question well, we can start to get some real clarity around what really are the ways that we would know we've achieved that. So if the second question we've got in our KPIs, there's this other little thing that people sort of trip up on and they think, oh, my KPI is conversion or my KPI is customer satisfaction. Well, conversion and customer satisfaction, those aren't KPIs. It's not a KPI if it doesn't have a target. I've worked with a lot of CPG companies and I've done a lot of social media, so that's the place where you get this all the time. We've never done this before. There are no industry benchmarks. We don't have any historical baselines. I cannot set a target. We're just doing this to learn whether this works or not. We will promise Tim we'll, we'll set a target the next time, the next time through. But it's our KPI, we just don't have a target. To which I politely respond, a KPI is not a KPI without a target. So it's hard, we want to be able to set targets that have the same precision as history. We wanna predict the future. We wanna gnash our teeth and say there's uncertainty. Uh, we, we can't set a target. We might fail, we might miss the target. But we're never more objective about what we might accomplish than before we've set out to try to achieve it. That's why in, in fitness, people set goals. Even if they don't achieve them, they actually kind of are aware they haven't achieved them. They're aware that they're, they know they've become close to what their expectations were. They can have set expectations up front to say, I want to lose 100 pounds in two weeks. Somebody can say, that's ridiculous. It can't happen. So we have to set targets, and there are ways to set targets. Even a scientific wild-ass guess is better than, well, we'll know it when we see it, or we're just learning. A couple of techniques I use to do that. One is the old back of the napkin technique. And I say, if, you, if I held a gun to your head, figuratively, not supporting guns in the workplace, uh, and said, you have to set a target. I know it's hard to be precise, but I'm gonna pull this trigger if you don't at least show me that you did the best you could and put some sort of logic behind a target. Don't worry about whether it's, I'm not gonna, pull the trigger whether or not it's super accurate. You just have to make a good effort. People will come up. They'll realize they actually have uh, uh, data. And I mean, I'll be the guy putting the gun to my own head, figuratively, uh, looking at the data that we do have and estimating. Get, use a little bit of wisdom of the crowds. Get two or three people and say, just pretend you have to come up with a target. And in desperation, what would you do? Come up with it. Let's put our napkins down on the table and see if we're at all in the same ballpark. We can come up with some target which grounds us for a discussion of are we achieving what we sort of thought we might realistically be able to achieve. It also can surface if all of us come up and come up with a number that is generally they're all way too low for, us to, for it to make sense for us to spend $50,000 on this campaign, maybe we don't want to do it. The other technique I'll use is, is bracketing. I had a, a, an account manager it was an agency, it was uh, packaged goods, it was a uh, uh, laundry detergent. They were doing user-generated video on, from a, a Facebook campaign, trying to get user-generated video. And they said, she said, we couldn't set a target because we'd never done this before. It, it was not her, but uh, imagine the lady in the earlier slide. She said, we had no expectations, we didn't know what we could do, and then she volunteered that the campaign's been alive for a week, we've had 40 people upload videos, and I was, she said, I was shocked. I, had, I could not believe 40 people went through the hassle of shooting a video and jumping through the hoops to upload it. I'm like, but you, if, you can't be surprised if you had no expectations. So bracketing is nothing more than saying, you can pick a number that is low enough that everyone would agree that's bad. And you can pick a number that's definitely high enough that everyone would agree that's good. And maybe that's 10 leads versus 10,000. They're gonna be way far apart. Then you start having a discussion, working from the bottom up and say, 
well, if not 10 leads, what about 100 leads? Uh, that's still probably definitely bad. What about 200? What about 300? What about 400? And yeah, you'll get to a point where you say, I don't know, maybe, maybe that would be enough for this to be called a success, maybe not. And you can do the same thing from the top coming down, and you kind of converge, may still be a range, but at least you've had that, put that thought and discipline into it to say we have some target. We can asterisk the crap out of it and say it's a swag, but we started somewhere. It's something we can have a discussion to make sure we're all aligned. The creative resources, the stakeholders, the people who are paying, who have the budget, are we all on the same page so that when we move on, we can build a dashboard that has targets because goals and KPIs and targets lead us to meaningful dashboards and a meaningful dashboard is effective performance measurement. So this is one example of a dashboard. I can say two things or three things that happen in every dashboard that I put together. They're one screen. Okay, four things. Uh, they answer question one. So in this case, it's the blue boxes across the top. Those are answering that question one. What are we trying to do with this portion of the website? Answering it in plain English. It's a reminder to anyone who's looking at it, this is what we're trying to achieve. How are we gonna know if we've done that? Well, that's kind of easy to see which one the KPIs are because they've got color coding on them. They're red, red, yellow, and green. They're bolder. I've got some other contextual information there, but dashboards, they fit on one screen. I don't like to put the commentary in. Dashboards aren't, to me, performance measurement isn't about why something happened, and it's sure as hell not about explaining or saying, describing in prose that something went up or went down. The numbers are there, it's well represented. It's performance measurement. It's automated. In this case, you can automate stuff pretty easily, pretty cheaply. This is a client who uses Google Analytics, we use ShufflePoint, uh, and it's fully automated. This dashboard updates itself. We click a button whenever we want, and it refreshes and pulls in all the data, and we're good to go. I've done this with other tools hooked into multiple data sources. It can be Excel, it can be Tableau, whatever it is, you don't want to spend your time pulling performance measurement reports every day or every week. So if we've got that running, clicking along, then we get into the fun stuff, the hypothesis validation. We have to have done performance measurement and set that up right. So here we get into discovering, assessing, and prioritizing hypotheses. Everybody remember scientific method from high school? It's hypotheses. And really, an analysis, a good analysis, an effective analysis is nothing more than just testing a hypothesis. And guess what? More than just the analyst has hypotheses. Analysts have hypotheses. Marketers have hypotheses. The, the CSR in the call center, who's two or three times a week, gets the same basic confused customer about where they go to print out an R, uh, to, to return, to find information about returning a product, they have hypotheses because they're dealing with customers all the time. So everyone has them. But I keep using this word hypotheses. Hypothesis, and getting a hypothesis articulated is a little tricky. We don't necessarily want to blast an email out to the company that says, submit your hypotheses. Well, some of the people remember the far side, Gary Larson stopped doing strips years ago. One of my favorite strips is the one where he's talking to the dog, saying, bad dog, Ginger, stay out of the garbage, Ginger. And all the dog hears is blah, 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 Ginger. Well, if we send that email out to the entire company and say, what are your hypotheses? What the entire company is going to hear is, I'm dragging you back to high school science class. Um, and you're never going to get anything submitted. So again, we don't want to do that. Just like I've got the two magic questions from performance measurement, there's a way that I do two fill-in-the-blank sentences for hypothesis generation. And this is whether I'm having people fill them in specifically like this or whether I'm articulating from a discussion and I will frame the hypotheses these way, this way. The first is the actual statement of a hypothesis. I believe some idea. Well, that's great, that is a hypothesis. The problem is somebody could say, I believe that our website sucks. And that's one, pretty hard to validate that hypothesis and pretty hard to act on it, because what are you gonna do, unsuck the, unsuck the website? So that's why you have to fill in the second blank as well. If I am right, then I will take some action. And I can't realistically unsuck the website. So I believe the customers coming to our site 
many customers are coming to our site are looking for coupons and are unable to find them. If I'm right, then I will put a prominent uh, wayfinding call to action prominently on the site as to where to find coupons. Okay, now we've got something that we can actually validate and we know that if that belief is, is correct, then we actually are setting up to we will take an action. So now I'm gonna get a little bit in the nuts and bolts and I always forget to mention this. So at the little bit.ly in the footer, bit.ly slash web process, there's a whole bunch of downloadable stuff. So I totally stole this from Rachel from a couple of years ago when she started doing little bit.ly bundles uh, for the stuff she talked about. And so now I do that. And there, one of the things you can download is an Excel spreadsheet or a Google spreadsheet that is a hypothesis library. At this point, there are only two columns in a hypothesis library at this point in the process. The first column, column A, is the completing the first statement. I believe some idea. The second column is, if I'm right, I will fill in the blank, take some action. We're gonna build on to that farther with the rest of this process. But it, it can be a spreadsheet, it can be Jira, it can be SharePoint, it can be Lotus Notes, whatever platforms you have in place, you can run with it and set it up. We've got two fields. But the idea is anyone can submit very easily, very simply, plain English, no use of the word hypothesis, they can put ideas in which we're then gonna to need to assess. So somebody has to own a pretty quick turnaround within one or two business days. Every time hypotheses come in, they're gonna look at them and they're gonna assess them on two fronts. The first, is it clear? Did somebody submit the, I believe our website sucks hypothesis? If they did, we need to go back to them and say that's, that's a little vague and ambiguous. Let's clarify it. Oh, you really, you have two or three hypotheses. Um, so, we have to check on that first. And then the second thing we have to assess is how would we actually validate these? And I'll go back, Joanna mentioned there are a whole bunch of different tools. We have lots of data in our organization and that is totally true. We fall into the Maslow's hammer trap as analysts often. Everybody know that Ma same Maslow, same Maslow of the hierarchy world is also often credited with Maslow's hammer is all the world, when all you have is a hammer, all the world. Looks like a nail. I found that out when I was trying to find a good image for this. Random trivia. But really data-driven marketers recognize they've got more than just Google Analytics, or they've got more than just the ability to send email surveys, or they have more than just their site survey, their voice of the customer stuff. So we're adding to our hypothesis library. We've got, I believe, some idea. If I'm right, I will take some action. And then we're gonna very quickly say, to validate, to test this hypothesis, this is what I do. Not a full-blown validation plan, simply a, is this a, I believe uh, customers are coming to the site looking for coupons and are unable to find them. Well, if I go to Google Analytics, I can do things like check my site search terms and see if people are searching for coupons and if they're, those people are actually getting to the coupons page and if they're abandoning. But the fact is, if I believe people are coming to the site to do something, that's an attitudinal question, which is not, Google Analytics is a behavioral platform. I have a site survey on my site. Can I make sure I've got a question that said, why did you come to the site today? And one of the options is to find coupons. And I ask, were you successful with your task? I mean, that's the classic 4Q uh, survey uh, questions. So another thing that's downloadable, there's a little self-audit template. Yes, we have web analytics, but we also have our site survey, potentially. We've got lots of things. We can do A-B testing to validate hypotheses. We can send an email survey. Joanna listed like four more things that had not occurred to me. So it's not comprehensive, but if we sit down and focus on what is it we really have? Let's just sit down and figure that out. What tools do we have? What are they best? What types of hypotheses are they best for validating? Who owns them? Who are the experts? And kind of raise the awareness bubble uh, uh, tied when it comes to that. I worked at a pretty large creative agency and it was always the people who own these kind of weird little niche tools that had some really cool data in them, they'd kind of be, get frustrated because they say, nobody comes to me asking questions and I have questions I can answer with this tool. So we've got to recognize any of us who have a hypothesis, what do we really have at our disposal to validate that? But then we have to prioritize. 
And I would have loved to say that prioritizing, we've got all these hypotheses throwing in, flowing in all the time. I'd love to say, well, here, it's a simple formula. Plug in this, plug in that, and your hypotheses will be prioritized. It's not a simple formula. But we can use a formula to kind of guide the discussion about which hypotheses do we want to validate next. The way I've done this, and, and it's, been, it's worked really well, is come up with more. It's not just likely business impact and effort to validate. There's more to it. Does it align with our business goals? How hard is it going to be to test? Um, are we actually going to make the change if we validate this hypothesis? Or are we just going to find something that we're going to get frustrated because they're IT or opinion hippo reasons that we're not going to make the change? Validate. Assess them. High, medium, low. Put some weighting around these. Go through a little weighting exercise. How much do you weight each one of these criteria? How do you weight high, medium, low within them? Spit out a score. It's not given the answer, but it should take the truly kind of crappy ideas and push them to the bottom of the list, take the really stellar great ideas that came in from who knows where, push them to the top of the list, so that then a small group, two, three, four, I've done it with as many as six, can sit down once a week or every couple of weeks, go through that list, roll up their sleeves, look at who the resources are, look at what the ideas are, and figure out which ones are truly at the top of this list. So that, and that gets into a rhythm pretty quickly uh, once, once you start doing that. That's setting us up to actually validate kind of the best hypotheses. This has now set us up to actually have analyses that read to, lead to truly actionable insights because we've ensured that it's clearly articulated, it's focused. We're not just being told to go analyze the Facebook page. We have ideas of what it is we're trying to explore, what we're trying to validate, how we're gonna validate them, and what action will be taken based on potential outcomes. So I'm not gonna talk more about testing because they're, we just covered there dozens and dozens and dozens of ways to test and validate hypotheses. But then we have to act. And I mentioned this earlier, that first we have to actually effectively communicate the results, generally not with pie charts. Um, anyone paying attention? We're bridging between. OK. So uh, I tried to get another four hours from my presentation to rant and rail about effective communication, because analysts, we tend to suck at effectively communicating the results of analyses. And there are lots of people who are very frustrated by this, and I've got some links to some of my favorite reading on the subject. But yes, we have to effectively communicate what we did and why. And then we actually have to take action. So our process, it's not that hard to say, we didn't just deliver the results, but do we also capture, this is what we tested, and as a result, here was, here's the action we're gonna take, here's who's gonna take it, and when they're going to take it. And then if possible, can we quantify the, the impact that we got from that? Now, Tons of times, we cannot quantify the actual hard dollar impact from making a change. That's okay, but we have to ask ourselves, is it possible so that when it is possible to quantify the impact, we do that? Here's the other thing, and I've, you go through a, a site redesign, and the project manager's been cranking along, it's been running for months, everybody's frazzled, you had a bunch of bugs, you got fixed at the last minute, you hit the deadline, you pushed it out, the project manager schedules a postmortem for two days later and says, okay, we're done with the project. And the analysts are like, well, how did it do? I'm like, well, it's been out for two days. Like, I don't know yet. So part of what we need to do in the process is say, when we're making a change, when would we likely be able to have enough data to actually quantify the results? In the process, we need to say, here's the person who's going to own it. Two weeks or four weeks from now, they are on the hook for going back and measuring whether or not we achieve what we thought we were going to achieve. When possible. Again, lots of times where we can't actually quantify that. But we have to look at it and ask ourselves the question, can we, each time. Then I have this learn thing. Well, if we've already acted and we've quantified the results, what is there to learning? Well, learning means looking beyond just that near term I took an action. We've got our hypothesis library. Now you've got a lot of fields in it. You've got from this, uh, I believe, some idea. Uh, if I'm right, this is the action I'll take. Then here's how we're going to validate it. We delivered the results. This is the result we got. Um, this, is the this is the action we're going to take and when we're going to be able to roll it out. This is when we're going to be able to quantify the result. This is when we did quantify and we got the results. We've closed out a hypothesis. But there's one other thing we should always ask. 
Was, and we've done this a whole bunch of times. And we've done lots of hypotheses where we had a belief, we did the validation, said, no, doesn't look like that's true, don't take any action. Still valuable. For every one of these, we should say, was there a deeper learning? Did we figure out something about our customers that warrant that we can apply going forward, that we should share with the broader organization? Most of the time, the answer is gonna be no. But sometimes there will be. And it doesn't mean we had to have taken action to have gotten a deeper learning. We may be blowing up myths within the company that we can, can capture, and in those handful of times where we say we've actually gotten smarter, let's capture that. Imagine it as kind of one big row in that spreadsheet. I mean, you can download the spreadsheet, and it, it lays, out, lays out that way, but it could be in anything. So we can now sit down once a month, or every other month, or maybe once a quarter, and we have this nice little exportable thing that's a grid. And it says these were all the hypotheses that came in. These are the ones that we were actually prioritized and validated. These were the ones that drove action. For some of them that drove action, these are the results we got. And you know what? In a few cases, we actually got a deeper learning. So a lot of that, we can just feed back to the organization and say, this is, these are counts. And it's useful to say, this is how many hypotheses were generated. Hey, people, are, we're not generating hypotheses at a good rate. Uh, but more importantly, this is like the basis for us to do this kind of meta-analysis in a presentation that we go back to the organization and say, hey, in the last two months, look at how we were hypothesis driven. Look how many people contributed. Look at the results that we actually achieved. And the ultimate goal is that not only are we, are we taking those action and moving the organization forward, we're actually helping our organization kind of reorient towards a business that has a kind of a culture of validated learning that starts recognizing when they have, oh, this is an assumption, or this is a belief, or this is an idea. I should stop and think, would I act if that's true, and could data actually help me act on that? So that's the full process. And as I said, there is a bit.ly link that it has this presentation. It actually has some stuff around performance measurement, kind of some more deeper tips on getting to, how do you get to really good KPIs, because we miss that so often. Uh, it's got the hypothesis library templates. It didn't really cover much on the way of uh, effective communication, so it's got some links for that as well. With that, I am done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim.